Well, now here's a staggering statistic for you. Homeschooling among black families increased by 500 percent last year. It's an increasing trend across the U.S., but especially in communities of color. Well, our next guest said goodbye to the public school system after feeling like it failed them and their kids. Education justice advocates Carrie Rodriguez and Bernita Bradley now run homeschooling initiatives that aim to give power back to parents. Here they are speaking to our Michelle Martin. Thanks, Fiona. Bernita Bradley, Carrie Rodriguez, thank you both so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, yes. You know, I'm going to ask each of you, like, what was your journey to uh, homeschooling? Carrie Rodriguez, you've had this experience that a lot of parents have had. This just that, you, you know, this is just not working for your children and you've got to figure something out. Like, what, what were some of the thoughts that led you to where you are now? I grew up, you know, I was in foster situations. I was growing up in a home that was mired with addiction. So my, mm -hmm. my journey actually begins with myself in my firsthand experience. I was expelled from a public school. I got my GED from Boston Public Schools. Um, I was lucky I was able to kind of scratch and claw my way into college, but it was by the skin of my teeth. So by the time I had children and I had three little boys, um, you know, I came in, I was a union organizer. I was teaching other people how to advocate for themselves. So when I, my oldest son was diagnosed with ADHD and autism, I was like, this is going to be fine because even though I'm coming into this with my dukes up, like I'm going to be able to advocate for my kid and I'm going to get this done. Well, what I found out very quickly when my son was suspended from school 36 times in kindergarten was at the end of that IEP table, I have no voice. As a parent, no one cares. No one's on your side. And all of those educators had already given up on my son by the age of six. They were done with him. They were pissed off at him. They were writing him off. They're calling me to pick him up. They're putting him in a redirect room that looks like a cinder block cell. And I, I was horrified. But I had no idea what, what was going on in our education system. I just, you know, the great trauma of my life was being expelled from school. I thought it was my fault, uh, not knowing that literally we, we have a system that's set up to fail kids like me, kids like my son. I, I didn't know any of this. All I knew is that I had no power. And when I get mad, I organize. Tell me about your organization, Carrie. What, what does the National Parents Union do? What, what, is, what do you do and what's the goal? So we are all parent advocates, activists, and agitators. That's what we are. We are more than 500 organizations all across all 50 states, D.C. and Puerto Rico, and it's parent-led advocacy. You know, there are pockets of parent power in all corners of this nation. We have mamas who are, are building groups in their neighborhoods who are doing building solidarity together so that they can speak with a united voice, so that they can share resources and we can talk back and forth, and then we can speak truth to power. But what's the goal of the parent union? How would you describe it, the National Parent Union, of which you are the president? How would you describe the goal? The goal is to ensure that every child in America has equitable access to high quality education. So, Bernita Bradley, tell me your story. You were being committed to homeschooling for some time. So, as briefly as you can, tell us your journey on that, will you? Yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll say here in Detroit, we only had 13% of our kids reading on grade level, 16% right before the pandemic. And during the pandemic, beginning of the pandemic, children didn't have access to tablets, tools to even make online learning possible. Families were tapping out. Uh, specifically, my daughter asked me in fifth grade to homeschool her, but during the beginning of the pandemic, she was in 11th grade. And she came to me at the end and told me after having interactions with only one teacher for five months, and she was like, if my senior year is going to be like this, I'm dropping out. And I was like, well, no, you're not. So what do we need to do, right? And so she was like, well, let's try homeschooling. And I'm like, okay, well, let's do this. What do we need to do to do this? So Again, we're, we're activists, right? So if my child, like, and based on just the other voices we were hearing from our community of parents tapping out and tired, we were like, what do we need to do? What, what do we need to learn how to do to homeschool? And then we opened up Engage Detroit, our homeschool co-op. So now we had coaches for parents who wanted to homeschool. What do you need for your child, for your individual household to homeschool and make sure it's successful for your kid? I'm going to go back to something you said. You said that your daughter had been asking to be homeschooled since fifth grade. How did you react when she said that to you? Like, 
that I, I, I can only imagine the feelings that you would have had. Yeah, so my daughter had been through extreme bullying. She'd been through bullying with teachers, um, schools that were just were poor managed. And and at fifth grade, she was just like, I tap out. I'm ready to, can you homeschool me, right? And my thought, first of all, was, okay, I'm not an educator. I don't need to be at a desk with you all day. Like, hey, get it done. Do this, do this. And I'm working all day. So I didn't have, I felt like I didn't have the autonomy to do that. I didn't have the wherewith to do it in as far as all the other tasks I had as an advocate, as a community organizer, as a mom. So I tried to find my daughter better schools. I tried to find her, like she got into an A-rated school in fifth grade and that A-rated school still failed her in the city of Detroit. It still did not have what she needed. Um, throughout her lifespan, my daughter has been in eight different schools. And that right there was not just like, oh, this parent who's like, I'm just going to keep switching schools. We fought for change in those schools, fought not just for the change of my daughter, but the change of all the kids in the school. Carrie Rodriguez, if you were to sort of sum up what you think is wrong with the way education is set up in this country right now, and I'm thinking particularly here at K through 12, what, what would you say that is? We have systemic racism in literally every system in our country. And we have generational systemic racism that is embedded in our education system. And we don't address it. We cover it up. We say we want more money to fortify the school to prison pipeline. And we do not confront the deep problems that we have in our education system. How do you think that plays out? Like, can you just give me an example? Well, we'll take a look at the demographics of the people who are leading our classrooms. 80% mm -hmm. of our education, our, our, our educators are, are white women. Okay, the belief gap in this country is very real and we do nothing to confront that elephant that is in the room. I mean, we have people who are leading our classrooms who believe kids like mine are not capable of proficiency, are not capable of excellence. That is embedded in our school system. We have people who are literally calling the cops on our kids. We don't address any of that. Instead, we blame them. Mm -hmm. We blame people like me and people like Bernita. Like, I, I, I'm not just a parent. I'm a former student. I have lived experience. I already went through this system. And now I'm told that I am mandated by the government that I have to put my kid in the same seat where nothing has changed. One of the things, the interesting things that's happened is that the parents who are pushing for kids to go back to school, the physical school, tend to be white. It tend to be, and the kids who are going back tend to be white. Among African-Americans, Latinos, and Asian parents, they are more likely to continue to keep their kids at home or to continue to ask for a remote learning option. So it isn't just African-American parents, it's people of color writ large. And I'm just wondering why you think that is. Fundamentally, like this played out in our living rooms. Like we were, were bearing witness to what goes on in classrooms, the way that educators talk to our children, the lack of rigor, the lack of competency. And parents were watched, literally watched the system fail in front of our eyes. What the pandemic did is for the first time ever told poor black and brown folks that, oh, only you know what's best for your child. We've seen that actually having our kids in a different environment, some hmm. of them blossom when there's no racism that they have to deal with on an ongoing basis, where there's no distraction, uh, where, where there's actual choice around the, the curriculum that they get to access, that we could actually have a culturally competent curriculum introduced to our children. And we, and we get to opt into that. And, and, and we get to play the role that we've always wanted to play. So we have this, this toothpaste has been let out of the tube. I don't know how you put that back in. There haven't been a lot of large scale studies on this, but the data shows that the number of black parents homeschooling has increased exponentially in the last like five years. Is it your view that part of the reason you're seeing more parents of color not wanting to send their kids back to in-school learning and more parents of color opting, uh, opting out on a long-term basis for homeschooling is that they see that schools are built for white kids, or at least they're not built for their kids. Do you, is that they, the bottom they, line? You think that these schools are constructed 
Right. Go ahead. I said it right the first time. Schools were built for white kids. They didn't even want our kids in schools back in the 1920s, in the early 1900s. They didn't want our kids in their schools. And when our kids did come to their schools, they changed. They changed curriculums. They got older books for our kids, right? History lessons are not built for Black children. And families, again, they're recognizing it. And the families that are tapping out, though, mind you, they're not just tapping out from one place. They are tapping out after they've tried public school. They've tried charter school. They've tried a whole lot of things. Most mm -hmm. parents aren't just saying, I'm just done, one and done. So how, how does homeschooling fix this problem? How does homeschooling change those dynamics? Yeah, so homeschooling puts the power back in the parents, right? If you won't reinvent and reimagine education for the for the sake of all children, for the sake of our children specifically, because they're the most marginalized. If you won't do that, we decided to do it ourselves. We no longer gonna wait for you. We're pushing for change. We're showing change. When a parent can understand that they can educate their own child and they see it happening, other mm -hmm. other parents see it happening. And we create this collaborative of our own to say, we're going right. to make sure our children get it. We create partnerships in the community to make sure with STEM programs, science programs, all type of programs to make sure our children get it. And those children are going off to college. They're going off to careers, becoming engineers. They're st we're seeing it happen. You know, you know what's interesting about this? Though? It's, it's, it's fascinating to talk with both of you because there are elements of what you're saying that, of course, have been advanced by a lot of the conservative political activists for some time now whose primary goal, I think is, I think it's fair to say, is weaken the teachers' unions, which they see as a uh, key constituency of the Democrats. And I take it that that's, clear, that's clearly not your motivation, but what do you say to that? I mean, I know that some of your organizations do get funding from some of these conservative activist groups, um, but how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? From Go ahead, Carrie. Like Listen, we don't have permanent friends. We have permanent interests. Our North Star is our children, okay? And that, that is what we're primarily focused on. I don't have the same funding mechanism that a teacher's union is going to have. I can't pass a law that says anybody who becomes a parent is going to have to pay me dues the way the teacher's union can. So when people talk about our funding, it's kind of comical. Like, where would you like it? We need to do this work to advocate for our children. Right now, the conversation is dominated by the people who are running the status quo in the system, and our voices aren't even a part of the conversation. So we need to be a part of it. To do that, we have to write grants to anybody who will fund us, including we have asked the teachers' unions. But let me say this. Yes. Uh -huh. and again, like the problem we have in our education system is that we don't even, the, the outcomes that we get for our children are secondary, if secondary. You know, it's, it's, a, it's of no consequence. It's how do we maintain this employment system that we have created? Now, I don't think you know, that teachers, you know, shouldn't be a part of the conversation. Of course they should. But right now, it feels like they have every seat at the table, including ours. They speak for us, and they don't do, they are not close enough to the pain. They don't have the firsthand experience. And that's why we keep doing the same things like over and over and over again. Can I ask you get, to get your take on that, too? I want to ask yeah. about the fact that a lot of the people who are so financially supportive of these efforts are some of the same kinds of conservative activists who have also been, who are, A, are very interested in disrupting the power of the teachers' unions, who are very interested in weakening a core Democratic constituency, and frankly, have not been terribly interested in their kind of uh, systemic racism as a social sort of problem. And I just want to ask Bernita how you think about that. Because I'll just say to you, if I may, since we've been very, we've been very frank with each other here, that there are those who, who believe that the reason that some of these groups are as interested in African Americans and people of color homeschooling their kids is that they would they would like to get them out of the school system. So what do you so say me, to that? So let me address the public schools being threatened. Public schools are not threatened because of charter schools or the push to try to destroy public schools. Public schools are threatened because public schools fail children. Public schools fail brown children as historically has failed us, right? And parents are tired of it. And the cycle of continuously doing the same thing is what? Insanity. And if parents are gonna keep trusting in the fact that you're gonna be a best actor 
on behalf of our children, but we don't see any evidence of it. We don't see any evidence in the in the um, MEEP scores. We haven't seen any evidence in the college rate scores. We haven't even seen it in, uh, in the uh, economical status of Black people in inner cities who go off to college and come back and they're working at Applebee's for 20 years because they were not prepared for school. Public education has devastated some households generations and generations of children going to the same schools. That is the problem, not where funds come from or any mission-driven agenda on my behalf. Are you ever concerned that the homeschooling movement takes the most activist parents, like yourself, out of the system? Uh, I'm not concerned about it. I'm a hybrid parent. You know, my kids go to different kinds of schools based on what's best for them. Um, So, and, and I don't think any parent is going to just completely throw up their hands and say, I don't care about any other kid, especially activist parents. Like we don't do this work because it's fun. Because trust me, it's not fun. It's emotionally draining. Like people call us everything except the name our mama gave us. Like it's, it's a lot. Like what? Like what, what do they say? Well, they assume that because what we've built here is so powerful because we're able to do things. We're able to be a part of policy conversations because we're able to get seats. We work together. Uh, We speak with a united voice. And now there is a united independent voice of parents that's not co-opted by anybody. But what they try to do is make it seem like poor black and brown women could not have come up with this idea. Mm. Somebody gave it to us. Somebody installed me as president. I was elected to this position by 185 organizations across this country in New Orleans. Nobody, nobody gave us this idea. We created this together. We, we speak together. We, we are a council to each other. And, but there's always... See, that, see like, that's part of the problem, though. They don't want to think that we can, we can coalesce. Like, they don't want to think that we have that power or that much uh, wherewithal to be able to combine together and combat what they're doing. So they see you as a sort of a front for the, say, white conservative yeah. movement. Is that but it? They don't, that but they don't see the years of advocacy where we were advocating from everything from little mm-hmm. corners in our community to mm-hmm. across this country, right? They don't see that. Carrie Rodriguez, what do you think? What What do you think should happen now? We're in a transformational moment, okay? Mm-hmm. And all of our polling, we've done 18 national polls. And parents, families, and communities see keep saying the same thing over and over and over again by a more than two to one margin. This is a moment to reimagine education. They don't Mm -hmm. want to put their kids back in the same box that was not working before. We are addicted to an antiquated system that does not meet the needs of our children. Mm -hmm. So what we have an opportunity to do is something transformational and say, instead of just doing things the same way, we've had an unprecedented disruption by necessity. Are we going to take this opportunity to learn these lessons and say, you know what, by any means necessary, we're not married to a particular governance model, a particular way of doing this. What we're married to is getting it done for our kids. And the outcomes that we want is equitable access to opportunity. And if that looks different for different kids, then we're going to create a system that's flexible to meet their needs instead of meeting the needs to the adults that really like this system that does not work. We know it doesn't work. Bernita Bradley, Carrie Rodriguez, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you for having us.